Καλησπέρα σας. Before I start, let me say this was supposed to be our last lecture, but because we will not, we we, we still have some time before we break off for Christmas. There will be another lecture on the 18th of December by Professor Ioanna Kakuli, who is at the University of California in Los Angeles, and she will be speaking at the multidisciplinary study of colors and wall paintings and Fayoum portraits and other things, and that will be on the 18th of um, December, okay? And for those of you who may not have received an invitation, tomorrow we'll have an info day for the MedStack program, this uh, program that we are collaborating with the uh, Technical University of Cyprus. But tonight we are here for another reason. So, dear colleagues, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this evening's lecture by a good friend who has come from very far away and after a very long absence from the island. It is a pleasure to introduce Tracy Island, who I first met 20 some years ago, I shouldn't be saying this, but anyway, that's the, the fact, when she and her husband Neil Irwin, like me, worked on the Sydney Cyprus Survey project, which was directed by Bernard Knapp. The four of us then collaborated again for the Trodos Archaeological and Environmental Survey project, so it is wonderful to have them both here with us this evening. Tracy Island is an archaeologist and heritage practitioner, currently Associate Professor of Cultural Heritage and Head of the School of Creative and Cultural Practice at the University of Canberra in Australia. Tracy's career has also included working for the New South Wales Heritage Council as the state archaeologist and running the Canberra Office of Australia's largest specialist consulting heritage and archaeology firm, GML Heritage. She undertook a PhD at the University of Sydney, which was awarded in 2001, and publishes on historical archaeology, the ethics of cultural heritage and conservation, and the enlarged entanglement of the study of the past with nationalism, colonialism, and the politics of memory and identity. And those of you who know Cypriot archaeology will know that this is quite relevant for us, although it's a subject that is more sensitive still here. Tracy is currently on sabbatical and has been visiting research fellow at the University of Stirling in Scotland. She's known internationally for work on the ethics of cultural heritage, the social value of heritage, and the relationship between historical archaeology and nationalism in the settler or past colonial world. She has undertaken research and published on the archaeology of British colonialism in Australia, New Zealand, Quebec in Canada, and northeastern United States, and of course in Cyprus, where she contributed to the Trolls Archaeological and Environmental Survey Project. When she returns to Australia in 2018, Tracy will be leading a major new three-year digital heritage project called Heritage of the Air, Heritage of the Air which has received around $1 million Australian dollars in funding from the Australian Research Council the National Museum of Australia, the San Francisco Aviation Museum, and Air Services Australia. We are particularly happy that she will speak to us about her work on digital cultural heritage, as just almost two weeks ago, the Sylvia Ioanna Foundation endowed a chair in digital humanities within the Faculty of Letters of our university, and thus finally the University of Cyprus will participate in this very important new field. So, Tracy, she will talk to us about digital ruins, exploring digital heritage methods in the Ottoman and British colonial landscape of TASP. This is the Trodos Archaeological Environmental Survey Project. Thank you. Thank you. Can we drop down the lights a little bit? Ah, oh, beautiful. Okay, thank you for that lovely introduction. So my paper today is uh, very much work in progress. Um, on an uh, experimental new project, which we're calling Digital Ru Ruins, Chasing Future Feelings. And we've literally just completed our first field, week, uh, w field work just last week, so our analysis and processing is still very much in train. But we rather cheek cheekily, if not optimistically, um, uh, gave a report on this in Manchester last week, and it's really nice to have an opportunity to talk a little bit more expansively about our ideas this evening. 
So I've uh, collaborated uh, on this project with one of my PhD students, Tessa Bell, and I'd like to acknowledge her contribution and to thank the University of Canberra for my funding. Um, I name a few other people up there um, who've given me enormous amounts of help and support, um, so thank you. But most particularly, I need to thank my most important collaborator, Neil Irwin, who um, was also a researcher on the TASP project and without whose support and assistance uh, this work wouldn't have been possible. So this evening um, I'll structure my talk with an introduction to the ideas and concepts and aims of digital ruins and then show how we hope that these aims can build upon and interact with our earlier work on the Trudos Archaeological and Environmental Survey project. So TASP, as you've heard, was a, a joint project of the University of Glasgow, the University of Cyprus and Oregon State University, co-directed by Michael Given, Bernard Knapp, Jay Noller and, of course, Lena Cassianadou. We did field work from 2000 to 2005 and published a major two-volume work in 2013. So I was invited to contribute to this project as an historical archaeologist, an archaeologist who specialises in the recent past, more particularly the colonial past. And it was this perspective that uh, Bernard Knapp invited me to um, provide to a landscape project that really took in the entire sweep of human occupation over more than 10,000 years. So I was very fortunate to work with and learn very much from Michael Given and Savina Floridou in particular. And it's been uh, very exciting and rewarding for me to have a chance to think again about these places and about our interpretations and look at them through a new lens. But before talking um, more about TASP, uh, let me explain the background to the digital ruins ideas. So the driving concerns of the Digital Ruins projects are questions that trouble the dominant rhetoric around digital preservation by record practices. And this is specifically 3D data capture and the generation of 3D uh, visualisations of heritage sites and places um, as a way and, and suggesting that this is a way of preserving these places and things for future generations. So the dominant discourse that pervades preservation by record is uh, one of unwavering optimism, resolute that something of the substance of the material thing persists in what are often portrayed as notionally objective digital objects. So we wanted to start with a simple question. What of us sticks when the material is generated in digital form? And what of us can be found or felt when we encounter these digital fragments. These questions led us to propose um, what we call our DIY adventure, that is your, our do-it-yourself um, adventure with very accessible Agisoft Photoscan Pro software. And we designed it particularly to be lightweight, low-cost, um, consumer-grade um, software because we also wanted to explore ideas of whether this uh, technology could be used um, in community work that we're involved in and whether in fact we could involve our, uh, or use it to teach our undergraduate students. So we felt very endorsed by Elizabeth Gross, Gross's mantra here. Um, so as a complete outsider to the technical aspects of the virtual world, armed with our new cameras, uh, software and a monopod, we in the last couple of weeks have sallied forth out into the landscapes looking for memory and meaning. So claiming that a detailed, forensically accurate digital data compilation is a form of preservation for complex heritage sites and landscapes, such as is proposed by organisations such as SIARC, and here's a, a shot from their website, is clearly a problematic statement that several commentators have started to critique. So 3D data records and vis visualisations obviously have very important potential for heritage management, um, for developing as arguments for particular theories and interpretations about the past, and they may provide resources for all kinds of future research as well as for a wide range 
of creat creative practices, speculations and explorations. However, critics are intensely questioning the evidence for the accessibility and long-term stability and usefulness of these 3D digital records, their capacity for reuse and recycling, and exactly how they will make good on their promise of making heritage more widely available and contribute to uh, its democratisation, which is a term that you see used a lot in heritage literature, and it's about challenging expert views of heritage, perhaps with more grassroots um, ideas about what heritage is. So others have, others have also pointed to the deployment of digital technologies as a form of cultural diplomacy that perhaps rehearses forms of colonialism, introducing new forms of what some have called digital colonialism and reducing the world's cultural heritage to a series of material icons that can be digitally preserved by a technologically and commercially superior West. A British archaeologist, Sarah May, recently called this in a, in a qu uh, quip, um, the quest to save the world by scanning. And many have commented on the possible negative implications of naive for forms of digital utopianism. Uh, William Kilbride, who's the director of the Digital Preservation Coalition in the UK, has recently suggested that 3D data is already facing um, what he calls an endemic crisis of obsolescence, resource discovery and corporate abandonment, suggesting that the rush to capture scanned data and to make digital objects has not been matched by a concern for the sustainability of these records um, and you know, the preservation issue that they put forward. He also suggests that there's a problematic disconnect or lack of, di of communication between the 3D data capture and visualisation community on the one hand and the broader digital preservation community. So as is clear to most professional audiences, digitisation or digital data capture is not digital preservation. In fact, it creates a digital preservation problem. However, the term digital preservation is so widely and extensively used in the popular media particularly around efforts to digitally record and or reconstruct archaeological sites and objects that have been destroyed in Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan and in other sites of violent conflict. The organisation SIARC that I've uh, just mentioned very clearly terms its mission as one of digital preservation and even refers to its staff and volunteers as digital preservationists. So this loose use of terminology is obviously frustrating for those who work within established digital preservation workflows, such as IT professionals, librarians and archivists, supported by a range of international doctrine, charters and guidelines. So these critics all question the objectives and political economy of this 3D data capture rush and the lack of transparency about commercial interests through the promotion of particular for-profit products or expert businesses and the way this promotion talks up threat and loss through disaster, climate change, human conflict and destructiveness. So while I share in the excitement that experimentation with new technologies engenders and fully endorse research that's playful and experimental this is quite a different prospect to leading poorly resourced sectors such as heritage management agencies into investing in digital uh, records that may not in fact be sustainable. So, and what might these digital records mean to communities who love particular places or have family connections to them? This is something that uh, my colleagues Stuart Jeffrey and Sean Jones have recently explored in their accord process in Scotland and I was lucky enough to have the first part of my sabbatical working with them. And they've been looking at making digital records uh, in a co-design project with communities and studying how authenticity is negotiated and generated um, by communities uh, who get involved in this process. So in this vein, our interest in the problems of uh, digital ruins is not so much in what the ca camera or the scanner records, but in what and how it generates through an embodied, 
on-site encounter with materiality. Therefore, our project focuses on the generation of 3D visualizations as both method and site of ethnographic encounter, rather than as the outcome or the end game um, of archaeological or heritage studies research. So we're curious about how these digital things, should they need to fulfil their role as future relics, how would they perform as heritage objects that evoke and sustain illusory belief? Regardless of whether these records capture some aspect of space or form, how would they persist as heritage objects? And perhaps it's worth considering how they will evoke their own time, the time of their making. Will the current archives of Sketchfab, and that's the name of the online repository that's been built to um, um, archive these, uh, these records. How will, how will these records look in the future? Will they look as quaint, weird, kitsch and faintly unethical in 50 years time as a masterpiece of Victorian taxidermy does today? Consider also that early archaeological photography tends to be studied today for what it tells us about the history, history of the discipline um, and its development of a skilled vision, rather than the items that were actually in the photographs. So we believe this is important to bear in mind amidst a rhetoric that sometimes errs on the side of digital records and visualisations as an end in themselves, rather than another means in the history of representation. So our, t our aim in taking a practice-led research approach is to be particularly attentive to the activities and methods that frame our engagement with our two field sites, what we see as our two field sites. One, of course, is in the landscape of the Trodos Mountains, which I'll, I'll move to in a moment, and the other field site is in the digital field of Agisoft Photoscan, suggesting that archaeology and heritage studies more broadly have a tendency to black box the links between the cultural concepts and taken for granted assumptions about how certain of our practices record, capture or interpret values and memories. So the term black boxing was introduced by Bruno Latour, the historian of science and technology, to describe, and I'll quote, quote him, the way scientific and technical work is made invisible by its own success. When a machine runs efficiently, when a matter of fact is settled, one need focus only on its inputs and outputs and not on its internal complexity. Thus, paradoxically, the more science and technology succeed, the more opaque and obscure they become. So this idea is part of Bruno Latour's work on making the social and cultural construction of technology visible to highlight vested interests and, and powerful actors and regimes. It also highlights how various technologies uh, become accepted, even though we may not understand their detailed workings, and not only accepted but deeply trusted in broader society. So this body of theory is clearly very relevant, we think, to look at how our new technologies impact on disciplines like archaeology and heritage studies. In fact, we suggest that much of the work around digital cultural heritage and 3D visualisation tends to be what Latour calls invisible work. When a 3D visualisation is created that is convincing and compelling, the human behind the camera or the scanner, the choices made by the data processes tend to disappear. And the public, at least, if not expert audiences, tend to consume these outcomes as objective versions of reality rather than as interpretations produced within a complex set of epistemological, social and economic conditions. So our methods for the Digital Ruins Project are based not only on this study of science and technology, but also on a number of key ideas from archaeological and digital ethnography, as I've mentioned. Uh, so Janis Hamalakis, uh, an archaeologist at uh, Brown University, um, his concept of archaeological ethnography is what he describes as an attempt to engage seriously with photography, not as a documentary process, but as another cultural field that has important ethnographic, 
um, sensorial and uh, lost my place and ontological implications. So ethnography in its broader sense is understood as an account of culture from the point of view of those who practice it. Both Michael Shanks and anthropologist Sarah Pink point to the importance of the concept of the assemblage, the meshwork, networks or webs, which signify the relationships and associations between people, places and things as the site for ethnographic inquiry. As well as, of course, the politics of inclusion and exclusion which constitute these networks. For Pink, um, this emphasises how digital ethnography is in fact an, an engagement with becoming, performance and movement, not a representation of a static reality. And she encompasses this notion in her term, the ethnographic place. If we understand place as constituted through movement, the movement of persons, things, the intangible flows of energy, the weather, the sunlight and of the emotions, then as researchers, we need to find ways to follow these things, these sensations and feelings. Similarly, she sees digital images captured in the field, not as representations, but as traces of the movement of a person and the camera through an ethnographic place or assemblage, the outcome of an engagement, an embodied and placed encounter with the human and non-human world. So we conceptualised our fieldwork as aiming to do what Pink calls finding ways to follow things, sensations and feelings, recognising photography and its manipulation in the digital field site of the software, Agisoft Photoscan, as an ethnographic place or encounter site, but with us, the researchers, as both object and subject, as an acknowledged part of the assemblage. So, to explore these ideas through a case study, we decided to return to a landscape that I'd built an attachment to as an archaeologist over 15 years ago, which we've mentioned, the, the, the landscape of TASP. So TASP was a methodologically and technologically sophisticated GIS-based archaeological survey project. It had explicitly reflexive survey methods and aimed to create a comprehensive digital archive that could promote multivocal and multi-perspectival multi interpretation, not only by the large team of archaeologists and specialists involved in the project, but in the future by other users through lodging the linked relational database and comprehensive GIS-based survey results with the Archaeological Data Service in the UK. So these aims are particularly uh, seen in the 2007 online article published in Internet Archaeology by Given, Corley and Solis, which enables the reader or the user to follow their own lines of inquiry through the rich data set. So when I had an opportunity last year to apply for funds for a sabbatical project this year, the opportunity of returning to the TASP archive and to the TASP landscape to, po to both explore new theoretical and methodological approaches to digital technologies. I decided that this could be a rare opportunity to explore these methods in a uni uniquely data-rich environment and with access to the detailed GIS layers, the image and artifact database, as well as the oral history um, interview archive and so on. Also important was the fact that my colleague who spoke here a few weeks ago, Erin Gibson, um, was undertaking her Marie Curie Fellowship in the area. And this led to the choice of a Sinu village, where Erin was also working, as the key focus for our mini fieldwork field work season this November. So that was the location. And so here's a picture from 2001 um, of the site of the abandoned village of Asinu, uh, which is an, on a, a spur looking over the, the World Heritage listed um, Panagia for Viotisa um, church at Asinu. So my work back in the early 2000s was focused much more pragmatically, as you might imagine. It involved spending a lot of time in the sun with a camera, compass and tape measure, pencil and notebook. 
documenting the landscape of the recent past. And my focus was the Ottoman and British colonial period remnants, particularly abandoned rural villages and water mills. And these are the remains of the system of intensive agricultural production of the Ottoman period in Cyprus and of the gradual impact of the economic and social changes wrought by British colonial policies from 1878 and local resistance and responses to these changes. So when the task project began in 2000, it was reasonably unusual for the Ottoman period to be included in landscape archaeological survey, and it was even more unusual to include the British colonial period. So my aim was to focus on the transition from the Ottoman to the British colonial system and how this was manifested in the landscape. So it's been broadly discussed in the international literature that the physical remains of the Ottoman Empire tend to have been at best ignored and at worst removed from the cultural record of many countries encompassed by the former empire and even to some extent in the Republic of Turkey itself. In the late 1990s, growing interest in the cultural heritage of the Ottoman period um, sought to investigate in particular the nature of changes occurring in the 19th century in the area in order to analyse and better understand the roots of present social and political conditions in the light of the recent past. My task fieldwork focused on two abandoned villages, Mandres, shown in this image here, and Asinu, which were occupied from the, late 18, or from the 18th to the early 20th century, bridging this transition from Ottoman to British Empire. These places and their history and memory in local narratives provided a window upon changing notions of identity, individuality, and the quality of, of a rural life in the context of colonialism, expanding capitalism, and European modernity in the region. As Michael Given has pointed out, the Ottoman period has been represented as one of crippling taxes and oppression of rural presence in Cyprus. Givens argued that despite the historical characterizations of the 17th and 18th centuries in Cyprus as periods of depopulation and abandonment of rural settlements, Mandras, Isinu and other se seasonal settlements in the northern Trudos are evidence of an intensification of rural production during this period. So this stereotyping, oh, and this is the cadastral from the 1920s um, of the village of Mandres showing the huge number of threshing floors um, around the very small village as evidence of the intensive agricultural production of that late 19th, early 20th century period. So this stereotyping was exacerbated by the official British characterization through the lens of colonial discourse of Cypriot agriculture and Cypriot peasants as somehow backward. In 1922, High Commissioner Michael Stevens, Malcolm Stevenson, in an argument against self-government, describing the rural villager as, and I quote from the record, possessing an attractive childlike simplicity, he is at heart an Oriental. This, of course, was language that I was very familiar with from Australia and other locations in the empire. The British imperial regime's failure to seek cultural, and in this case agricultural, sophistication in any other terms than those of the Industrial Revolution and its narratives of development and progress has led to characterizations of Cypriots in the Ottoman and British colonial periods as oppressed and downtrodden. In addition to the British determination to exploit the mineral wealth of Cyprus, and their intensive construction of infrastructure, roads, bridges, railways to support this, intervened, um, this construction intervened in what we argued was a strong and resilient rural economy with the lure of cash and access to industrial commodities. So in the TASF study area in the late 19th and early 20th century, British, British records show that whole villages Men, women and children were employed in construction projects, disrupting annual patterns of rural production. 
And these projects includes, as I mentioned, road building, bridge building, and of course the Scuriotisa mine as the, the central feature of the TASP study area. David Lavender, the chronicler of the Cyprus Mines Corporation, um, claims that women employed by Gunther in the construction of the buildings for the Scuriotisa mine in 1913 used the cash to purchase extra food and also to put aside for their dowries. And while Nichols, the British road engineer, uh, he claims that people of the village of Avriku volunteered to build a road for the British for free for the, because of the benefits it would bring to the village. I'm a bit sceptical about that claim myself. Um, so these interve interventions appear to have contributed to changes in the perception of the quality of rural lifestyles. A memory not of increased access to commodities and cash, but of hardship, poverty, and the abandonment of traditional ways. The abandonment of Mandras and Asinu was explained to us by those who lived there prior to the 1940s as a result of people moving away from the rural areas to find better paid work in factories and mines. And the final period of occupation just before World War II was described as a period of poverty, hunger and hardship but often also a greater sense of community and cohesion, which was often mentioned by the elderly folk that we interviewed. One of our interviewees, born in 1928, left Mandras in 1945 to work for the Water Supply and Irrigation Department for a wage of nine groschen a day. He recalled, rather poetically I thought, that our trousers were like a map of Europe, they had so many patches. So to study, um, to study the landscape is to study the experience of what some people call multi-temporality, how past and present are entwined in both material and social terms in place and space. And it's this renewed interest in archaeology, in materiality, in what some people call material vibrancy and agency, that has suggested how we might re-engage with the TASP archive and the TASP landscape and how digital method methods might contribute to understanding more about how old things retain the power to shape and influence social life, how objects accumulate long biographies and how memory is formed in a complex dialectical feedback loop with the pushback of the material landscape. So spending long days amongst the ruins of colonialism, my aim was to understand this Ottoman to modern, modern built fabric, as we called it. And a Sinu village, it's one of the, the viaducts from the um, water mills in the study area. Um, a Sinu village is very simple architecture, reused, patched and altered um, up until probably the 1960s. So it's not an intact example of any particular type um, and, and wasn't uh, thought to have um, characteristics that would make it worthy of preservation or, or heritage interest. So documenting the biography of these structures, observing and recording how they've been altered over their periods of use, adaptation and abandonment, the multiple styles of masonry using stone from dis different sources, the then quite rare surviving flat mud roofs and the most recent additions of mud brick, concrete and corrugated iron. So what interested me archaeologically was the evidence of successive periods of abandonment and reuse, probably over around three centuries, a pattern that was corroborated in the historical evidence suggesting that Asinu had been completely abandoned in the 1880s but then reoccupied by at least three families in the 1920s. And this was just the plan that I produced to explain to myself um, and the project how the, the uh, village was um, abandoned, crumbled, and then reused and rebuilt um, over several periods and just uh, contrast the straight lines in that map with uh, the images that you'll see in a moment. So through interviews with local people, I learnt that the last couple to live in a Sinu here were Solomus and his wife. Their daughter told me that her mother had died in this room. And like so many places in Cyprus, the melancholy aura of abandonment was palpable. 
despite the harsh, unforgiving Cypriot sunlight, which picked out the evidence of the daily lives literally mortared into the walls of the village. Broken clay tile, pithoi storage jars, colourful medieval scraffito pottery, and the handle of a Roman amphora, all observed eroding out of the melting mud mortared walls. These walls thus what Shannon Lee Doherty calls a social stratigraphy in describing the dialectical tensions between urban material pasts and presence. To, to paraphrase her, people make villages, but not exactly as they please. The endurance of old materials, the robust and massive stone water mill, pottery, ruins and relict walls shape later communities and the vibrancy of the brettiated accumulations of village life, the lively mud matrix of human and non-human action and interaction makes Asinu a heterotopia, a place where time collapses and is experienced differently from places which express themselves in terms of progressive history. So my reflections on our ethnographic encounter with the Agisoft Photoscan, Photoscan Pro software. So our first conclusion was that this was an astounding, astoundingly intuitive program and great fun. And this might speak to our narrow experience with this type of software, but it did not, for instance, seem as threatening as the dark abyss of AutoCAD. Instead, it loomed as a beckoning expanse of possibility go out, be in the world, see things and return with the trace of your movement. The magic software will pull it all together for you. So this romantic uh, notion, for this romantic notion to work in earnest, the software in fact requires very specific movements in preferable conditions. Orbit around an object in a non-occluded landscape, in a soft, consistent light that casts no ephemeral shadows, that could obscure its understanding of the material forms it is tasked with translating into new data real versions on a different plane of reality. So here's just some of the, the process uh, that we, we went through. And uh, I'm not showing this for any factor of whiz-bangery um, or technological sophistication. Um, this is consumer grade software and the idea was for us to experience it uh, in the landscape. So here's the, the model that's being created and then the, 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 the texture, the surface texture is applied to the, to the 3D model. And this is the water mill in Nikatari, um, which the, um, the people of Nikatari, some of whom had moved um, down from the abandoned Asinu villages or their families had um, identified uh, this water mill. Um, of a place um, of value to them in Erin Gibson's recent fieldwork. And it's, um, and here, of course, the, the, uh, the, the water mill is, is not floating in the ether, but uh, we tried to capture the, the landscape around it just using photography. There's obviously much more sophisticated means you could uh, use to capture the topography using drones, um, et cetera. But uh, because we have these very handy mountains all around the sites in this area, we just walked around the mountains and, uh, and used our cameras. And there's the finished uh, detailed uh, model placed in the topography. So the water mill at Nikatari, and in particular, the abandoned village of Asinu, um, defied these ideal conditions. As I've said, dramatic topography, a mess of striking walls overrun with prickly caper bushes and strewn with ruinous debris, a site of collapse and disorder, thus presented as a form unfit for the logic of the software. But in part, this was the point of the exercise, as was our taking up of consumer grade, relatively accessible, re what's called reality capture technology. So just going through some of our attempts to render the, the chaos of the abandoned village. And those of you who've looked at uh, 3D uh, digital renderings on sites like Sketchfab will note that most of these sites look 
appear to be very clean and, and ordered. The vegetation is taken um, away in order to focus on the recording um, of the built elements. So as the experiment unfolded, we adjusted our postures in the field to the behaviour of the software, toggling with the limitations of our photo sets that they'd imposed on the point clouds um, and tangential fourth dimensions which popped up um, hours after we had trod the perimeter of our object. We traipsed over the mountains, conveniently overlooking our sights, and stumbling over the ruins and through the landscape and traversing the span of our Agisoft parallel field site, it became apparent that the pursuit of digital objects using this software is marked by judgments, choices, decisions. The process does not hold to principles of objectivity. The models are inflected with the convictions, persuasions and persistence of the human at the helm. So here's the initial rendering um, of the, the crumbling village of Asinu. So the makerly process of the rendering has a definite auteur, a creative director, whose vision, technical mastery or lack of it in our case, um, cultural background, understanding of visual codes of aura and authenticity, and their feelings about these, these landscapes and the old masonry definitely shape the outcome. We found that Agisoft may produce different outcomes from the same data set at different times aligning photographs differently in separate trials, and that it does not care for per peripheral details, for pixels on the edge. It prefers discrete boundaries. As such, our newly moulded objects do not adhere to the aesthetics of emptiness that seem to dominate the, these rapidly growing digital archives. So what are the overt intentions of the pervasive neatness of the digital world? What is gained from the production of clean-cut representations devoid of any clues of chaos, the sense of sprawl, the evocation of heterotopia replaced instead by an atmosphere of ghostly absence? So what's emerging for us is that Agisoft Photoscan is digitally constituting what anthropologists might call a thick assemblage an ethnographic place which has become the site for a particular kind of encounter with materiality, history and politics in all its messiness and ambiguity. We are using the software to trace our embodied experience, tracking the movement of the sun and changes in the weather. Just as we awkwardly clambered over the ruins, it also st the software also stumbles over the ca caper bushes and wild olives that occlude the ruins from the software's focus on formal architectural qualities. Rather than presenting new answers to old questions, the digital ethnographic context suggests new kinds of questions and opportunities for, for reflexive engagement with disciplinary frames and methods and, pr and provides a critique of the notion of the objective permanent digital record. So. so just uh, earlier in November, I accompanied my colleague Erin Gibson to a kind of back to Asinu day with the, the school children from Nikatari School. And one of the elderly residents, Haniotis Lobas, was te telling stories to the school children about his life in those houses. He was actually storying that little stone aperture uh, in, the, in the wall. Um, the children were, were very engaged by his performance. And, this, and, and now our next task is really to accumulate some of these diverse source, sources, uh, the interviews, the encounters, the, the ethnography, um, and the digital images. Uh, and our processing and manipulation will, uh, occur, will continue um, when we get back home and get access to computers with more RAM because we've exhausted what our laptops can do at the moment. So our renderings are of a place sticky with effect, deriving from an archaeological imagination and Western modernity's cultural memory of ruins and what Costas Corellis has termed recently the Mediterranean's comfort of perpetu perpetual abandonment. 
So we're using the software's algorithms as what Pink calls a way to follow things, feelings, sensations, as a method that archaeology and heritage studies can add to its currently quite meagre set of resources for deepening and strengthening, strengthening its links between theories of authenticity, value, memory and identity, and its fieldwork methods that purport to record an objective reality as opposed to tracking a unique encounter between emplaced and embodied agents. So thank you. the $64,000 question, yeah. really. And um, uh, there's certainly a lot, a lot of um, angst around exactly the issue that you raise at the moment. And um, in Scotland, um, Scottish, Her uh, what's it called, Historic Environments, Scotland is one of the leading actors in this field in, um, uh, in the world, in fact, and has had an initiative called the Scottish Ten, where they've been collecting um, digital records, they've done the Sydney Opera House, for instance, World Heritage listed properties. Um, but already they are facing, the, their early records um, have already become um, obsolete um, and they're already facing the um, fact where several of the platforms that they use to conduct their early work um, are now no longer supported by the companies that produce them. Um, uh, the, the, um, my Australian colleagues in, in Paphos uh, recently who had produced some very interesting early digital walkthroughs of the theatre at Paphos, um, I read from one of my colleagues, um, Brogan, I think his name is, that his, the early walkthroughs walk um, that he created, um, which were quite leading at the time, uh, no longer work. work. Um, because that's so software. So what we're looking at is what uh, Kilbride called corporate abandonment. What w the problem here, uh, as it's been explained to me by my colleagues, is is a, a, a business problem. Rather, th it's not a technological problem. I think technology can uh, work with these preservation issues, um, but it's a question of um, how the how it's supported in financial and um, you know, proprietary terms. So the issue for digital heritage is is how can the sector be effectively regulated or worked with 
um, or how could government regulate the sector so that there is some kind of uh, responsibility uh, recognised. Um, and this is, this is my understanding um, of the problem, but it's a real, it's, it's, it's a totally real problem. Mm. No, no, I haven't. Um, but I've I've met with the uh, the, the school teachers um, are my main contact, and I've promised that um, we will send them to the to the schools, um, and so that Erin will be able to to use them in, in her next stage um, of field work. And we're very happy to do that. We can turn the the three D um, images into um, PDFs. So that you don't need any special technology to move around the 3D model, and so the children should be able to play with them. And so I hope that we can get some feedback on what what they might make of them. Yes, 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 yes. Well, that's a good point. <laughs> or whether they might have liked them tidied up, as we didn't want to do. <laughs> It's, that's, that's an interesting question, and that's why I always get very worried when I see the SIARC um, website. I don't know if you had a chance to read the, the slogan um, on that website, but the slogan is preserving digital heritage before it's lost through climate change, disaster, or, or conflict. Um, and and yeah, I think it does set up, um, it does set up a dilemma. Um, you know, in world heritage terms, uh, you know, I think it's it's obvious that uh, that um, various forces will work towards ongoing preservation. But in Australia, for the heritage of the recent past, I have already seen many um, examples of where a digital preservation has been done because a site's been decided to let go, um, and and I j and I think. You know, there's a lot more questions. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a, an advocate for preserving absolutely everything. I think it's, it's, you know, it's a social issue that uh, needs to be balanced. But um, I, I'm, I am an advocate for thinking more deeply about what we mean when we say we're digitally preserving something. Um, and I think the techno the terminology, the slipperiness in the terminology. And the fact that the media link on to this term of digital preservation um, is not useful to to our um, prof profession, and it, it would be nice to to clarify. So, with our digital ruins project, we we will not claim that this is a preservation um, or a permanent uh, objective record of the site. We'll try to be. Um, as upfront and explicit as we can be um, about the steps that we've taken to produce it and what we think it represents and our limitations in, um, in preparing it. I um, I have hopes that uh, one version of this paper might get published in the International Journal of Heritage Studies. Um, there, I don't think it necessarily needs to be online. Do you mean to interact with the images? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Internet archaeology could be a vehicle for that. That's possible. There are a few other online journals that offer that. Um, um, interface with real-time digital data, but um, 
I don't think for the arguments that I'm really focusing on that you, you one would need to interact with the data, um, but it would be fun to do the other as well. Uh, well, I thought it might be most simple to, one can uh, take the finished renderings and, and cr just create PDFs that, um, that don't need any special technology to move through them. So Microsoft Office, uh, I think, has a standard 3D, um, what do you call it? Viewer. Viewer, thank you. Yeah, these days. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, uh, right. Adobe, yeah. Any other questions? Yes, please. I hope I haven't missed anything, but how would you feel about much older rooms? For instance, rooms that one way or another are isolated within a so called archaeological zone. I mean, I can understand the, the Ottoman British period. It's something, the period. Yeah, I'm. I'm sure I would. I mean, in the, in the absence of the ethnographic context that I'm that I'm working in, um, but I suppose my uh, focus on these questions. One of the things I'm really interested in is what persists over a long period of time uh, in the landscape, so that several generations of uh, of you know people might interact with it in different ways. Um, and, you know, the example here was the water mill, you know, there's been no water near that mill for a long time, but the mills in the TASP study area persists and, and people um, incorporate them into their, their daily use uh, of the landscape. So I would really like to explore, you know, if I had the option with older ruins to try and get more of a sense rather than this periodization that we seem to be quite so focused on in archaeology. This is, you know, uh, Bronze Age or, you know, early archaic, Hellenistic. It would be nicer to think about what, how did these things change and persist and how did, how would they, what were their social lives um, over the long term and how could we use these technologies to perhaps um, explain that and, and um, uh, get a better handle on that, that question. That's just something that interests me. Mm. Mm. What are we going to preserve and what's going to be maintained? Mm. And after all, this kind of monument will acquire a new kind of memory to the societies around it. Mm. Mm. I don't have answers either. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Not for 